God puts us down to two. Why don't we begin uh, with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, for all of God, and Mary, Mother of the Church. Mary, of us. And your Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you have any questions throughout, uh, please just raise your hand and we'll try to answer them. Our topic tonight is the first constitution, the first of four constitutions that the Second Vatican Council released. Uh, and this is the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. But before we dive right into that, just talk briefly about the Council in general, a little introduction to the Council. The Council all begins really with Pope John XXIII. Many of you probably remember him, at least his famous pictures, his jovial personality. He was a surprise in many ways. Uh, it was a great surprise to him to be elected Pope. He was almost 78 years old when he went to the conclave that elected him in 1958. And uh, many of his electors, many of the cardinals, just thought, well, we need someone to kind of, quote unquote, fill the gap, you know, uh, a, a quote unquote sleeper Pope who will uh, give us a few years and then we can elect uh, someone younger. Uh, but they elected John XXIII having no idea what he had in store and really what the Holy Spirit had in store uh, to do through him in his papacy. It was only three months after his election as Pope that he announced on January 25th, 1959, that he intended to in invoke, convoke uh, an ecumenical council. This was hugely surprising, uh, not only to the church at large, but uh, to the Roman Curious, to the Cardinals that worked closely with him. No one was expecting this, anticipating it. Uh, but John XXIII maintained to his death that this really came to him as an inspiration from the Holy Spirit. That he really believed that he was inspired uh, called by God to do this. And he meant for this to be a new council. Not for it to simply be a continuation of the first Vatican Council. Uh, and to that extent, he named it Vatican II, instead of saying he was going to resume Vatican I under that name. This was to be a new council. While it did take up some of the things that Vatican I talked about or intended to get to, there really, uh, there was a whole new agenda for the Second Vatican Council, and that was the big question when he called the council. What was this to be about? What was the topic going to be? And there wasn't uh, an especially clear agenda given at the beginning. He gave a few indications, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, but the council really uh, developed and uh, took on uh, quite a large life. Initially, the Pope and the council planners hoped that the Second Vatican Council would complete its business in one or two periods, sessions uh, at most. One or two sessions that lasted several months. In actuality, the council lasted for over four years. Uh, from 1962, the council opened uh, on October 11, 1962, and then ended on December 8, 1965. Now, if you remember back this spring with Father Allen to the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, that council completed its business in three sessions, lasting only three weeks. Uh, Vatican, the First Vatican Council also uh, was relatively short in comparison to the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council was unique in many ways. Uh, the number of people present in St. Peter's Basilica for the Council could vary from session to session, but generally there were about 2,400 people present, the great majority of them being bishops from throughout the world. Uh, bishops also brought uh, many times a theologian with them. Um, there were also, one of the unique characteristics of the Second Vatican Council is it was the first time to admit non-Catholic observers to the Council. There were all in all about 180 non-Catholic observers to the Council, which gave the Council Fathers uh, somewhat of different perspectives sometimes when they would propose different ideas, they would receive some feedback and see how things were uh, received by those outside of the Church as well. It certainly wasn't most important or definitive factor, but it did provide another perspective. 
there were, uh, at the Second Vatican Council, there were present all four of the popes who succeeded John XXIII. So, Pope Paul VI was there as Cardinal Giovanni Battista Montini. Pope John Paul I was there as Bishop Albino Luciani. And Pope John Paul II was there as Bishop Carol Gortiwa. And now our Pope Benedict was there as a priest, as a theologian, Father Joseph Ratzinger. Probably the last Holy Father we will have that will have been present at the Second Vatican Council, will have participated in it in some way. The media took a great interest in this council and covered it almost uh, continuously. There were many advantages to this, but there were also difficulties that it brought. Uh, one of the difficulties is, as we'll talk about over the next weeks, there were so many things, particularly uh, in what we'll speak about tonight, the liturgy, so many new things to be implemented. And with information being uh, disseminated so quickly, uh, and in a way, in a way it uh, hampered the implementation process, because uh, before things could be decided how to implement in the best way, sometimes people already had all this information and were beginning to implement it on their own without uh, it, kind of, it coming down in a more systematic way. Another difficulty that, that Pope Benedict talks about from his experience at the Council is that the media tended, you know, many of the media not being Catholic or at least not uh, deeply understanding the theological issues that were being discussed at the Council, many of the media tended to see everything in very stark terms and very uh, opposing terms as either a conservative or liberal and the fight between the two. So when they would present uh, things that the Council was doing, they would often reduce things to this level. And it, uh, it was unhelpful a lot of times uh, because as as Pope Benedict points out, uh, the truth is often much deeper than what can be reduced in a simple way to this mentality, this ideology versus that. The decisions of previous councils were directed almost exclusively to the clergy. Even when uh, some decision had the importance for the life of the lady, oftentimes these things were implemented so slowly that they weren't very perceptible to the lady. But the exact opposite was true in the Second Vatican Council. There was, first of all, a great rush to implement uh, the Council, and this was felt by many Catholics. Perhaps some of you uh, uh, can remember those days. No other Council could compare with the Second Vatican Council for the direct impact it had in the life of everyday Catholics, and with some considerable adjustments in the religious practice of Catholics. So the Second Vatican Council really had a very uh, profound impact on the everyday life of the Church. Now, the Vatican and Second Vatican Council did not have a clear-cut and narrow agenda established from the beginning. First of all, there was no obvious problems that were present in the Church in 1959 when John XXIII announced that he was going to call a council. There were no obvious huge problems that needed to be addressed. Ultimately, John XXIII wanted to address a huge range of concerns. He wanted to speak to all men and women in the world. And uh, he wanted to take up a kind of dialogue or conversation with the world. He said that he saw a need for updating the Catholic Church. This, this word he used, aggiornamento, uh, which is a kind of adaptation to contemporary circumstances. One, one of the phrases he used was uh, kind of opening the windows and, and letting in fresh air. Now it will become clear, hopefully, that uh, this was never intended by the Holy Father, by the Council Fathers, to be a kind of break with what came before, uh, or a kind of, you know, completely new beginning. But uh, simply as he saw, uh, there were some things that needed to be updated. He wanted to take up the pastoral issues of how the faith is being lived out and to look at the church's understanding of its 